Hello, you're watching the Telecom TV Summit on Open Telco Infra and our panel discussion on the challenges and opportunities of a broader open ecosystem. I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content. How can telcos best support startups, spin outs and new entrants? And whilst such an ecosystem offers more choices to telcos, it can also result in more challenges not least of which is getting everything to interoperate. So what's the best strategy for telcos? Well, let's hear the views and opinions of our guests. And joining me on the programme today are Jim Brismitzes, who is founder of the 5G Open Innovation Lab, Anshul Bart, who is head of intelligent operations at Rakuten Symphony, Eugenia Jordan, chief marketing officer for TIP, the Telecom Infra Project, Ali Kafel, Senior Director, Global Telco Ecosystem at Red Hat. Heather Kirksey, VP Ecosystem and Community for LF Networking. And Terrier Jensen, who is SVP Network and Cloud Technology Strategy at Telenor. Hello, everyone. Good to see you all. Thanks so much for taking part in our discussion today. So Let's get started. Let me first of all ask what types of new entrants are joining the open telco infra ecosystem? You know, are they spin outs from academia? Are they startups? Are they fully funded companies or, or are they from adjacent non telco industries? And also, how can telcos best support them? Jim, from your position, you know, what are you seeing from, from the community? What sort of companies are, are entering? Yeah, thank you, Guy. Um, there's a number of different players that are coming into the ecosystem that are not traditional to this space. Uh, as you mentioned, several of them are in the startup world and they're doing a whole host of new technologies around edge computing, beam forming, um, RF technologies, radio, new radio technologies, uh, and, and heavy uses of AI and machine learning for improving network performance. And so I think that world is actually quite exciting and it's growing. Um, there's also a host of non-traditional telco players that are actually bringing new capabilities to market as well, some of which we see here at the lab, and I'm not at liberty to share much of that, but I think you're going to start to see a little bit more uh, new players coming into this marketplace, bringing some new capabilities. We're also seeing um, that, that telcos are actually looking at a, a much broader landscape of technology providers uh, beyond those that they've worked with, not that the ones that they've worked with um, are limited in any way, but as we move more to cloud native, and my friend at uh, Rakuten Symphony can probably have an opinion on this as well, there's just a whole host of new capabilities that are being enabled, much of which has been learned in the big public cloud and hybrid cloud world already. Those principles are being brought forward uh, here. From a telecom perspective, I think telcos or CSPs have a unique perspective and a position today to look at a much more broader landscape. And as they continue to shape and push forward their 5G plans as it relates to both their consumer business and what I anticipate being a fairly large enterprise opportunity as well. Uh, they can start to draw on some of these newer technologies. That's also going to change um, uh, to the point you made earlier, Guy, how they go about integrating some of those technologies in many respects to the legacy systems that they are bringing forward from their 4G LTE days uh, to folks like Rakuten Symphony that are essentially taking a whole new page out of the playbook and starting anew. And we've seen a few of those players, uh, for instance, here in the United States with Dish Networks in India with Reliance Geo, of course, Rakuten as well. Great. Thanks very much for that overview, Jim. I, I find it fascinating, you know, that you, you've got companies from other industries outside of telecoms um, now coming in. And also, as you mentioned, you know, the enterprise element there is, is encouraging um, more like cross-pollination, if you like. Uh, Heather, I'll come to you in a second, but look, first of all, let's pick up what Jim says. And um, Ansel, let's, let's come to you um, and uh, find out you know, what you're seeing at Rakuten about the, the, the types of uh, new entrants uh, that are coming into the ecosystem. Yes, I think, you know, one new entrant or one type of new entrant that I'm really excited about is the telcos themselves. So a lot of telcos internal teams have been, you know, since every network is unique, they, they have been having this internal proof of concepts and, and researches. But now having this open platform underneath, like, for example, something that we are doing with Rakuten SimWorld platform, it allows telcos to also implement their applications, internal algorithms using the open APIs and platform services that such 
open platforms can provide and make those POCs actually see the light of the day. And one interesting aspect of this model is, I mean, of course, their internal algorithms and applications will help the telcos themselves, but also having such an open ecosystem helps them or enables those telcos to place those applications onto a public marketplace where, let's say, an innovation done at Telco A can actually be leveraged by a Telco B somewhere else, since everything is now, you know, working on an open ecosystem with open APIs, which can be easily integrated into a different telco. So we are seeing startups, we are seeing a lot of hyperscaler communities getting interested in telcos, but even the telcos themselves with all these talent and, and innovations that, that are internal to them are coming out into the wider marketplace and um, you know helping other telcos to, to enable um, and leverage this, this internal um, researches and, and proof of concepts and making them implemented at scale in production. So that's also a type of an entrant I'm really excited about to, to see more innovations from telcos within. Yeah, good points. Thanks very much, Anshul. Uh, we'll, we'll hear from uh, Terry in, in a second, but Heather, as has already been mentioned, you know, the, the, the progressive move towards cloud native and softwareization, it, it seems to be encouraging um, more entrants, more players, more, more talent, if you like, and ideas into, into our sector. Yeah, and one of the things that you know I've been seeing really increasing in the past several months is that sort of um, connection between a traditional sort of telecom, you know, five G capability and some more of the enterprise. You know, echoing back to some of what Jim was saying, that you know a lot of where um, our exciting work around our 5G Super Blueprint initiative and some of our integration and at our One Summit event next week is really figuring out how um, some traditional enterprise um, and industrial use cases, you know, we're seeing a lot of excitement around Industry 4.0 and how to interconnect you know, a factory floor with local sort of IoT capabilities into sort of a 5G network with all of that provides. And that is where I really see some excitement brewing because it's less sort of new entrants popping up in the telecom space, it's telecom and enterprise networking coming together to really enable things like worker safety, like um, retail, like, you know, um, you know, telemedicine and, you know, really the sort of partnerships and new types of end customers to the telecoms, which are more enterprise, perhaps less individual consumers with their smartphones to, to really sort of change some of the dynamics, economics and capabilities of these more traditional enterprise outposts that are getting networked in, realizing the capabilities of 5G, bringing in AI and ML. And that's where we're seeing a lot of you know, LF Edge and LF networking coming together a lot more than we ever had in the past to really you know, elevate what folks can do in terms of, you know, taking care of workers, ensuring that factories are safe um, and, and that kind of thing. And, and that's new. It's exciting. You know, we're seeing folks like Walmart and the U.S. Navy coming in with, you know, different types of use cases, but how to better enable these other types of experiences. And, you know, a little bit less than I think 5G was so much about delivering the internet to the consumer. I think we're about to see a moment where it is, if you have 5G and new advances in local networking, you know, what can be done to, to really affect, you know, industry and, you know, the industry 4.0 is where we're seeing a lot of excitement. Yeah, thanks very much, Heather. And I can't help but feel it's, it's almost like the, the floodgates are going to open soon. They, 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 they really are. Um, and perhaps we're going to need standalone core for that to, to really happen. Terry, you wanted to come in on this uh, point as well. Yeah, thanks, Guy. Uh, just, just quickly, not to avoid, not to repeat everything what uh, said before, but we also see, uh, as uh, the other commented, that there are quite a lot of different types of companies which are approaching us as, as a telco. So, so at, at one end of this scale, we probably have these, uh, these uh, which are early in the coming with just an initial ID. 
and the, uh, some of them are even bringing their initial uh, investors into the meeting just to bounce some ideas on what, what do we think about this as a challenge? Is, so, is this something we see a, a value out of and would there be a willingness to pay and so on, something? And then at the other end of the scale, we see uh, uh, big established uh, uh, companies uh, having uh, some, some spin-off or even a part of the departments where they want to, to offer something. And we also see the example of telcos uh, having, uh, having offers. And, and uh, just to reveal, we also are doing actually a spin-off and, and the providing services to other telcos uh, by, by our own companies in that sense. So we have the full range of, uh, of different types of companies. And then, of course, when it comes to topics, you also find the other dimension to it, everything from hardcore telco uh, hardware to, to solutions uh, and, uh, and the different integrations. And I think in particular what, uh, what Heather alluded to on the, on the 5G and uh, Industry 4.0, uh, is there is a lot of creativity from uh, from number of companies out there, which then typically tend to complement a telco. So it's maybe not entering a, a telco space, but it's more like complementing with uh, with all, other kind of assets, uh, just to come with a complete solution, for example, to an to an enterprise who would like to look for that. So I think we see again coming, we see the full range of of uh, entries uh, or uh, types of entries we want to uh, discuss with with telcos. This is all good to hear. Thanks very much, Terrier. Uh, Eugenia, let me come across to you. You know, are you seeing a sufficiently diverse and wide range of, of new entrants um, expressing an interest and, and starting to be active in the in the telecoms infra space? Absolutely, Guy. Thank you. So, in addition to seeing vendors and telcos and system integrators, your traditional players entering this new open and disaggregated world. We're also seeing new players coming in like universities, colleges, because we need to bring the new talent into the pipeline so they can integrate all these new technologies, AI, machine learning, cloud native. We see a lot of initiatives happening with universities that developing the talent for telcos. And the other new player, which didn't happen with five uh, with 4G, but it is happening with 5G, is the regulators and governments. They're thinking how those new solutions, open and disaggregated, can be integrated. So um, in the US, for example, there's the CHIPS Act, and the governments, they're thinking of bringing the ecosystem of all these new players to work on the integration of the solutions. Yeah, thanks, Eugenia. That's that. it, it, it's becoming an interesting new facet to, to this whole conversation now. That's, that's something we've not really seen before. Um, before I move on, I'm just going to come back to Jim because um, we started with Jim. So, uh, Jim, let's some, get some final thoughts uh, from you on, on this particular question. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I, I think everyone had um, really great points that they raised. In particular, I liked Heather's discussion around Industry 4.0. I, I, I think it's safe to say the playbook in 5G for the CSPs is, is not necessarily gonna be an entirely consumer play. And in many respects, I think it's the enterprise who's gonna be the biggest benefactor of where connectivity and behind that connectivity where edge uh, capabilities are going. And so what's exciting for us to see here at the lab and working with a number of startups is we're seeing both emerging set of um, infrastructure capabilities, both on edge computing, orchestration, all that fun stuff that happens in cloud and cloud environments that are a ripe opportunity for the CSPs to do far more with their network beyond connectivity. There's a healthy interest in a number of private cellular networks here in the United States and around the world. Um, to Heather's point that there's a lot of industry 4.0 investments being made in robotics, machine learning, big AI, um, all these new capabilities that are, are only truly possible with better connectivity and computing nearby. So edge, uh, I think is really quite exciting. So for the CSPs, the, the playbook is changing. And in 5G, it's not entirely a consumer play. It's very much a big enterprise play. And the spending power for the enterprise historically has been almost three times as much as what all CSPs generate in revenue on an annual basis. And so there's this huge new um, uh, market opportunity that is in front of them in the 5G world and then beyond that, the 6G and 7G worlds that follow. And I, I think that's what's drawing in some of these new participants, whether that be spin out startups or other non-traditional players that are now coming into that world. And you're seeing a lot of healthy interest from hyperscalers as an example, as they continue to push both in 
the CSP world, but also as they continue pushing in with new services for the edge uh, too. So I just wanted to make that point. I think everyone made fantastic points all the way around and uh, specifically where Heather was talking about industry 4.0. I think that that was, uh, that that is a very valid point that we're seeing here at the at the lab from an innovation standpoint. Yeah, indeed. Thanks very much, uh, Jim. Um, well, let's let's move on. And uh, Terry, I'd, I'd like to put this next question to you. You know, are there any fundamental changes that telcos could make to make it not only easier but perhaps safer to engage with new entrants? Because there's always a risk if you do this direct engagement with an unknown company. You know, do telcos recognize that perhaps they need to change procurement practices, for example, or whatever it might be to gain access to the, you know, the very best innovation that's emerging into the market? I think uh, at least how I see it from Telnor side, it's uh, yes and yes for the ones who got the questions. Uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, first of all, we, uh, are there fundamental changes? Yes. Uh, do we need to, to uh, have we recognized this? Yes. So, so uh, I'm coming back to the procurement maybe at the end, uh, if I may, Guy. So, so uh, what we have uh, at least learned from our side, I think it's, uh, it's very good as initial engagement to be open and transparent. What do we see the job to be done in a way? Uh, so when we sit there with a, with a partner or, or, or with a new entrant or a, or a new, new company, for example, uh, and I've walked through, uh, okay, so what problems are we, are we looking for to, to be solved here? And then to be uh, very clear on, on the, what can we do and what can we not do? Uh, and that, of course, goes both ways. It's not only the telcos, it, but it's also the partners uh, which needs to come, come, come there. So I think we have uh, we have been through uh, quite a couple of years now on on the Telnor side with uh, a rather fundamental change in the moving from historic procurement to more co-creation, joint innovation, co-development, uh, and it's basically back to also what to just to be, uh, make a bridge back to what Jim said recently said on. It's basically around 5G. And enterprises, I think we see that this comes together, and there really is a, is a lot of momentum now from uh, a number of companies to to come with proposals and reach out to telcos to to work on this. Uh, and the reason is, of course, that uh, they, we all want to succeed. I think so. That's a, it's a great uh, in, incentive on for all the parties. So, so we have a good experience on on co-creation, and we have demonstrated even with customers. Uh, and also customers want to be part of this, uh, these innovations. I think that's also good to recognize and open for that in, uh, in the engagement with, with all the partners. Uh, but not to criticize procurement, because procurement, uh, is, in the historic view, procurement had a, a very clear defined task to, to, to do. Uh, so they, they wanted to bring volume, they wanted to bring scale, they wanted to make sure that they are committed uh, deliveries uh, for a five to seven years uh, contracts. Uh, and if there's an operator group, for example, we, we also need the partners to deliver in all the countries. So that was the setup from the from the procurement. If you go five five years uh, back in a way, and of course that needs to be also changed. Uh, you cannot uh, come with all these requirements and probably thousands of technical specifications, legal requirements, uh, bank guarantees, and everything to a startup company. You need to uh, you need to uh, uh, engage differently with that. So the whole rules of the game is is uh, or the rules rule of engagement are changing uh, in order to innovate to this. And, and again, it needs to be clearly on on the, on open and transparent on what problem are we going to solve, and also willingness to to change as we as we uh, move forward with with the customers. And then of course it's uh, I think it's uh, good to see that uh, in a number of these industry industry 4.0 cases there are clear customer value which uh, both the telcos and the partners. We can collaborate with uh, in order to to uh, to implement. So, so I think it's it's good to to uh, to recognize from that from all the parties. And yes, uh, Telcos uh, I believe have recognized that this needs to change, and we need to work in that way in order to succeed in this. Very nice you said. Thanks, Terry. Yes, yeah, some, some positive positive news there as well. Um, Ali, let's come across to you next. You know, what are you seeing from? The ecosystem with your telco in, in, engagements. Are you are you seeing a need for change? Are you seeing uh, positives happening? Yes, guy, I am. Um, so what you know, in addition to the points that were just made, a couple of things we see changing since we're moving towards five G. I think the need for a truly cloud native is uh, is necessary. So we see some telcos really requiring. Uh, because we work at Red Hat, we work with several uh, partners, uh, workload partners, as well as uh, partners in the hardware side and drivers and so on. 
So telcos are requiring, uh, you know, workloads to be cloud native. And I think the, the other requirement we're seeing is the need to have a workload be validated or certified. So this would allow a telco to leverage uh, a startup that may have an innovative solution. But if that workload is proven on an open cloud infrastructure that's based on open source, it gives the confidence that that solution uh, is both innovative and also stable since it's been you know, validated and certified. So that's another requirement. And then to the point of procurement, the point that was made earlier, so a telco may not go and buy a total solution from a startup for obvious reasons, but if it's, if it's gone through uh, another partner that's providing a pre-integrated solution, uh, then they, that may work because they would take advantage of the innovation that the startup is, is bringing. But going through a, a bigger partner that has a pre-integrated solution, who's responsible to make sure that everything works and, you know, single provider providing the whole SLA. So those are the those are the areas we see positive changes happening. Mm, thanks, Ali. Yeah, you know, as you, as you say, you know, so much of this comes down to partnerships, isn't it? And uh, instilling that confidence. Uh, Anshul, let's come across to you for your thoughts on, on this particular question. Yeah, sure. So being at Rakuten, I have worked at both Rakuten Mobile and now at Rakuten Symphony. So I have seen both sides of the problems. And, and I totally agree with all the points mentioned so far that Telecom being a regulated business, it, it couldn't just be, you know, like like a small SMB where you just bring up a startup and, and you know, deploy their solution. But at the same time, um, being in Rakuten Symphony as a startup and, you know, approaching um, the new customers all across, um, we are bringing our own applications and, and, and use cases, right? So it becomes important for a new entrant to to have like an easier way to, to, to have your application inside and prove your value. So in, in you know, apart from the points mentioned by others, I think um, the concerns are valid, but at the same time, if the telcos can adopt right process and, and you know, technology around this whole um, deployment process, for example, having an open sandbox lab, having a CI CD pipeline where any vendor or a startup provider can come, come and bring up their solution in, integrate some of the API security services, go through the vulnerability and certification process, and then, um, um, what we have observed is that uh, the real value or the test of any solution can only happen in the field. So having a FOA cluster, as we call it in Rakuten, or first office application cluster or a sandbox cluster in the real network can actually help telcos evaluate and and and, and expedite the whole evaluation cycle before even procurement and, and the other um, commercial processes get in. So I think having a lean process comprising of um, an open sandbox, uh, the right CI CD pipeline with security embedded, and an FOA cluster sort of can help telcos to accelerate and, and evaluate the value, and at the same time, give the startup um, uh, providers um, or, or the application developers an opportunity to, to come in, use the lab infra, um, integrate with the open APIs, and, and have their CI CD um, based deployment. Pro I think having the right technology and process of the sandbox uh, FOA sort of an env environment is something that we are seeing more and more, and and even telcos realizing this this challenge of you know having this um, um, security and regulations and procurement on one side, but at this uh, innovation and and speed at the other side. So I think we are seeing more and more telcos being open to to this kind of an approach, um, and and in fact, like from from Rakuten standpoint, we have integrated with almost around seven to eight vendor um, labs through our central CI CD lab. So, so we are seeing more, um, um, you know, positive um, response um, towards this approach of um, deploy test um, uh, in a sandbox and then, um, you know, go commercial or go through the procurement process. So that has been our experience so far. And, 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 and we are seeing things getting expedited um, much faster for startups, especially. Great. Thanks. Thanks for those insights, uh, Anshul. Um, well, just, just before we um, move on, I'll quickly go over to Terrier. Of course, uh, what we see is that we need to adapt the approach according to what we want to achieve. So it's not going to be one process, one approach, which, you know, we cover, cover all the needs. So procurement in a traditional way will probably uh, still be there for, from, for some commodity products. So it's not like, uh, you know, it's fully going away. 
and we're not going to apply, you know, uh, agile and and, uh, and uh, you know startup engagement for for all the domains. So it's uh, choosing the right tool for the for the job to be done. I think is it's very important. Uh, so we also do, for example, lab. I think was also commented, but I think it's important also to keep in mind that some of these startups they don't they. Uh, they actually are, are lack of fund. Uh, so, so they need to get to revenue or additional funding quite quickly. Uh, so that, that also needs to keep uh, be kept in mind when you're talking about, for example, lab testing and those kind of things. It might not be that they can afford uh, all of these kind of things. Uh, so, so again, the, the right uh, tool for the, for the right job to be done, I think, is important. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, a spot on there. That's that's a that's a major factor. Certainly a major major issue that that we're hearing here at Telecom TV. Uh, well, let, let's move on because we want to cover some more ground during this discussion. Um, having a diversified supplier ecosystem, yes, it brings more choices to the CSPs, but it can also result in more challenges. We've heard some of them already. You know, getting everything to work together, for example. Um, but I'd just like to to ask some of our guests here: you know, What are the pros and cons? of a telco doing this themselves versus getting assistance from outsourcing partnerships, whoever. Uh, Eugenia, let's start by asking you and getting your thoughts on this. Thank you guys so much. So let's look at open ecosystem. So we went from three to four vendors, three to four product lines to 50 plus vendors, 50 plus product lines. So the challenge is how a mobile operator can integrate all those variations because there will be probably 500 plus variations. And this is where organizations like TIP, Telecom Infrastructure Project, we come in. We bring the industry, the ecosystem. We gather the requirements from the community of mobile operators. We create the roadmap. And then we test a particular use case, enterprise 5G, outdoor macro, and so on. This way, all the variations are tested and TIP gives the stamp of approval and mobile operators can deploy those solutions. So I wanna finish uh, my comment on a footnote. Mobile operators with TIP, they can come to a buffet table and they can get a plate of delicious components that has been already tested and approved. And they can take that plate to their table and enjoy. Eugenia, I'm hungry already. Uh, yeah, I, I, good comments there. And it's, an, it's a nice analogy of um, what is available to, to new entrants and, and uh, you know, best practices. Thanks very much for that. Um, Ali, I'll come to you in a moment, but first of all, I want to go to Heather and, uh, and hear Heather's thoughts. Yeah, I mean, and, and mine certainly follow on with Eugenia um, in that, you know, I think it's a bit of a false dichotomy to say that, you know, telecoms have to do it all on their own or they outsource to a vendor partner to work on some of this integration, you know, open source projects like, you know, us, like TIP, um, et cetera. You know, we provide a place where, you know, a single telecom isn't on their own, a telecom can work with other telecoms. And they've often, especially when it comes to infrastructure, have similar problems, and they're not necessarily competing with each other on infrastructure, they're competing with each other on services and, and other things at a higher layer. And so, you know, if the telecom operators of the world have an opportunity for them to collaborate with each other, to collaborate with their entire, you know, supplier ecosystem in, you know, a, a friendly and, um, you know, open source collaborative environment, you know, a lot of that doesn't have to just be you know, internal on, on a grinding hamster wheel, wheel trying to figure that out. Um, you know, I mean, that's, that's the point of some of our organizations is we are here to bring people together to figure out some of these issues and to work them through. You know, um, I remember back in the early days of NFE and SDN, uh, Margaret Kiyosi from AT&T said, I'm just tired of having to work pairwise with every single vendor in the world and then finding out that all my peers at every single operator is having to do the same thing and we're all exhausted. Um, and that's, that's the beauty of, 
you know, an open source organization, um, you know, we're a nonprofit, um, you know, all the other sort of standards and open source organizations are as well. We all have something to bring to the table. We provide the opportunity to say, you don't have to do it alone. You shouldn't do it alone. You have peers at your similar companies. Um, the, you know, the vendors would like to talk to you as a little bit more of a collective, maybe outside of a straight one-on-one -on -one sales engagement. And, you know, let's figure out some of the underlying infrastructure issues together, because then that makes the innovation for the services um, just so much more rapid if we put, you know, a little bit of work into looking at it as a collective problem. You know, we all know that I always, you know, talk about the sort of the, the joy and the meaning of working together, but, you know, we're deploying, we're deploying worldwide communications infrastructure. It's not easy and you don't have to do it by yourself. There are people who are here to help and, you know, bring that to the table. Yep. Thanks very much, Heather. Use whatever help you can get and, uh, you know, look to the community. Thanks for that. Well, we've got a few comments we want to get through. So first of all, uh, let me go across to Ali. Yes. Uh, thanks, Guy. So to just build on Heather's point and Eugenia Pryor. So yes, it's, I think at the end of the day, uh, we telcos need to have the choice and the flexibility uh, to not do it all by themselves. They can't because there's so much innovation out there. What we do at, at, at Red Hat is enable the telcos to do exactly that. Some telcos want to take the different workloads that we've tested and certified and do the integration themselves. And some are very capable of doing that, They're certainly the larger telcos. But some of the other telcos, even larger ones, but in many cases, the smaller ones, they don't have the means to do that. They don't have the resources to do that. So they want a you know, system integrator, which could be another ISV or could be a traditional system integrator, to put it all together for them and offer them, offer them the solution as a bundled single vendor accountability SLA. And, and that's the choice we give our, our telco customers is by working with so many vendors, uh, both on the workload side and the hardware side, uh, we get all of that uh, essentially ready and where some of our partners will provide that pre-integrated solution and that way the telco has a choice. And that is true not just in a private cloud environment but also in a hybrid cloud environment which we all know the world is deploying hybrid cloud today. So even in a hybrid cloud environment if they're going to use AWS for example they, they should have the flexibility if they decide to go use you know, Azure to do that easily. And that's the flexibility we really provide our telco customers. So you know, we call that pre-integrated horizontal solution. You know, there are some companies out there who would take different components, that, you know, they call it, you know, it's based on open source and they would offer it as a vertical solution. And essentially, as long as it's all coming from them, uh, then it's fine. Well, that's not that's not choice. That's not flexibility. So by having the you know pre um, horizontal solution where some telcos who choose to put it together themselves can do so, and those who choose to have an integrated solution can do so, whether it's in a private cloud or public cloud, I think that's ultimately the flexibility. Uh, that the telcos are looking for. And that certainly has been our experience. Great. Thank you for those comments, Ali. Um, we'll go next to um, Anshul, then we'll go and have a word with Terry. But Anshul, let, let's hear your thoughts first. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the, the points that were mentioned before with all these, um, the, the, the infrastructure, the ecosystem getting more open, there are a lot of choices. And I think um, with all these lot of choices, the dream is that all the telcos out there will have similar two pizza teams like these hyperscalers have where everyone will talk to each other via API contracts and, and all should be good. But I think the reality is, and, I, and especially for the brownfield operators in their network, um, there are a lot of legacy systems which need to be integrated to as well because they can't just simply forget all those legacy systems and start afresh. So I think 
while um, uh, it's 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 all getting open and 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 there are standardizations helping out into this journey i feel based on our experiences at telco that the telcos do need to have their internal um, teams also build up who can understand how these um, you know multi microservices hybrid teams work and and in order to truly drive or finish such projects we we have definitely seen that unless the telcos themselves have some internal driver who understand how these integrations work how these these open apis and 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 platform architectures work it it might get difficult yeah and i think um, one more concern is the security while all these open systems are talking to each other who will who will ensure that you know the communications are secure or or some of these interfaces are not getting intercepted for whatever reasons or hacked so i think um with because of the security concerns um i do agree that um a pre stand uh, like a pre certified platform for example i think we saw some examples from red hat from lf networking from tip um and even in rakuten symphony we are creating our own marketplace where we do that job of pre certification in terms of security in terms of interoperability which will which which telcos can leverage um you know as a as a baseline in order to to do the deployment or have a blueprint for um for the deployment in the network but at the same time the devil is in the details and every telco is a different especially the brownfield ones so some level of customization um and integration work needs to be driven um from the telco side and 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 we are seeing that having this skill set or mindset internally instead of outsourcing that uh, has definitely helped great thanks very much anshul and uh, terry you know we've been talking about this having this diversified supplier ecosystem gives telco such as yourself more choice but there's also more challenges uh, for example and we've been covering this in some detail integration challenges what what are your thoughts you know i think uh, and a lot lot of good things have been said so so i'm trying not to 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 repeat but i think we are very very appreciative for all the standardization and harmonization going on on the on the global level so thank taking that as a starting point so so uh, whatever it comes out and are fixed and and uh, you know normalized uh, before it then some of my table are very appreciated so so but coming back to the question about okay so how much should we have you know within an operator and and how much should we get from from others so 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 we are coming from the the simple principle on that uh, whatever we must control uh, we need to control you know and that so you can never escape from the responsibility i think uh, anshul also raised that uh, in in the brownfield uh, discussion for example as we are delivering a critical uh, critical service uh, you can never escape from the you know they want to be blamed from the, your customer if you're not delivering that service or from the government for example if you're not uh, complying with the with your obligation so so that you can never escape from and that means that there are certain things you you must have in uh, within your control uh, typically with uh, understanding of what's going on inside for example understanding you know the the, the market uh, understanding also the the legal frameworks uh, also understanding the portfolio of partners and so on but having said that i think also anshul said that there, there is a lot of good things out there so so there are quite a lot of things that others are actually doing better than than uh, than telcos so so uh, so so we really are appreciating that you know we can get it from from others in a in a much better way they are, are they doing more quicker uh, they are higher slas uh, they can do it you know uh, cheaper and so forth uh, but I think uh, also back on the the way you phrased the question is is as we see it, it's not really in-house versus outsourcing. We see that outsourcing is grad because outsourcing might be uh, referred to that someone else is doing the same task. They're just doing it quicker or or cheaper, or whatever. But we see that more and more on these uh, discussions actually turn away from outsourcing into as a service model, which then really alludes to a kind of a partnership setup where we have a, a joint incentives, we have joint uh, objectives to to and also do cause uh, joint financial uh, uh, targets on on this. So so that's the way we are. It seems that the m many of these collaborations with telcos and others are are evolving into this kind of, of, of mindset. So I think that's also part of the question. So it doesn't have to be, you know, either it's in fully in-house or it's fully fully with someone else, but it's actually a collaboration to to more and more extent. Well, that, that, that's fascinating, Terry. It's like a, a whole new type of relationship that, that's emerging here, um, not just an either or option. That's great to hear. Um, we are we are getting close to the end of our program, but I do want to quickly sneak in a quick question. So. Um, any uh, rapid thoughts and, and uh, suggestions from our guests would be appreciated here. But final question, can telcos be more proactive? Is there more they can do to help 
these emerging players, these, these new entrants into the telecoms ecosystem? Is there any way they can be perhaps more open about what they need? Any, any tips or advice? Um, Ali, let me come to you first. Yes, uh, based on the experience we've had with uh, uh, our telco customers and uh, also Telenor as a customer, so thank you uh, for being here as well. Um, but based on what we've heard, it's, it's really, I think what, what telcos can do to be more proactive is really, you know, demand solutions that are, you know, pre-tested or pre-validated uh, and also demand it to be uh, flexible to run on a variety of platforms um, and, and avoid the, the lock-in. And when I say variety of platforms, uh, I mean, not just on a private cloud environment, whether it's running on a, on a servers like vendor one, vendor two, but also in a public cloud environment. Uh, and I think making sure that if a vendor is offering a vertical solution, that that solution is based on, on an open infrastructure, uh, essentially components of a horizontal uh, cloud infrastructure, because only that model would give them the flexibility to be able to choose, uh, choose and pick on which platform and which environment they deployed on. Great. Thank you very much for that, Ali. Yeah, good advice. And Anshul, some uh, quick comments from you. Yeah, I, I think I totally agree with what Ali mentioned, that telcos need to be more vocal about um, you know, what they want and be more assertive in terms of have following the standards, following the open APIs and and, and standards, you know, um, and one basic mind shift that, that is needed is, you know, um, to understand the at scale mentality. And, and when I say at, at scale, it's not just scale in terms of number of network elements, but also scale in terms of number of people who can contribute towards automation and AI, and uh, R apps and AI ML algorithms and stuff like that. And, and you know, in order for telcos to enable people to contribute at scale, and especially their own employees, it becomes very essential that that they get the right support from the vendor. So instead of, you know, treating a vendor software as like a black box, which only vendor managed service providers or or the experts can do, um, it, it, it will definitely help telcos to to actually innovate and give opportunity to their own employee to to contribute towards all this innovation is 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 by being more assertive and um, and strict about the standardization and 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 you know conformance to the open architectures that are being laid out there. So at scale mindset uh, in terms of network and in terms of people is 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 necessary. Great, thanks very much for for those comments, Anshul. And any fi final comments? Uh, quick comments for our guests, uh, Heather. Uh, you, you'd like a final quick comment? Yeah, well, Anshul actually said a few of the things I was planning to say, but it's just being very vocal and open about the requirements because people can't implement your requirements um, unless you let them know. And so that is the the opportunity that I think is available to us, which is, you know, be open, um, explain what you need, and then explain how it differs. You know, because it's very easy to say, here's a standard um, and, you know, do a lot of theoretical work, but continue to participate as you attempt to, um, you know, deploy it, actually integrate it with other components and what doesn't work, what does, and, you know, keep, keep iterating on improvement. Heather, great. And thanks thanks for those uh, magic final words. You know, be open. You know, that, that's so, so important here. We must leave it there for now. Thank you all very much for taking part in our discussion today and sharing all your views. Now, if you're watching this on day two of our Open Telco Infra Summit, then please send us your questions. I'm sure you've got lots of them after this. Uh, and we'll answer as many as possible in our live Q&A show which starts very soon. And don't forget to view the other panel discussions and keynote interviews in this year's summit. They will all be available to view on demand from tomorrow. For now though, thanks for watching and goodbye.